that. I'm just and, like, gonna I feel like ever since I started working, if I have like the hard day or something, like, I skip, you know, like when I was in college, I used to be more like. Let me try and get out. I had a for the longest time. I was supposed to do like a shot 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 Cool. You ready? Yeah. Oh, so your husband runs too. All right. All right. Ready. Okay, so good. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for well. No, you're fine. Thanks for being patient with us here. So now that we have everything kind of going, um, right? So I'm Colin. This is Rich. We're gonna go give backstories in just a little bit here. But like, basically, the the concept behind this was that like, you know, I've been kind of wanting to do this for a while. Was every month. Uh, kind of talk about a different topic regarding running and, and all things running, whether it's strength training, biomechanics, uh, you know, there, there's just so many nutrition, recovery, tapering, um, you know, and then bring in, uh, you know, kind of specialists who, who really know what they're talking about here. Um, so the first one, you know, kind of, and you know, we're kind of looking at this you know, the first thing I kind of wanted to tackle was understanding what training actually means uh, when we talk about like creating a training plan. Uh, and and this, you know, this isn't going to get into huge detail. We're not here to uh, like dictate to you this is the perfect plan, mainly because as Rich would tell you, there's you know a thousand ways to skin a cat, and uh, you know this is more about developing curiosity and getting our brains kind of you know curious about like how can we you know view training through different lenses and how can we, you know, kind of look with, with maybe a little bit more methodical uh, appreciation for what kind of what's going on. So my background, so um, I've been running or was competitively running for about 20 years, uh, made it up to like 214 in the marathon, have taken it pretty seriously and I feel like I have kind of tapped myself out. Uh, my body has finally said I can't do this anymore. Uh, so now on the other side of, you know, being an athlete and now switching more into the coaching role. So, uh, that is now, uh, my more full-time gig. Rich, so Rich, I've known Rich now for probably four or five years. We took graduate classes together at Westchester University in the exercise science department. And, uh, what I really liked about Rich is that he was somebody who I could really just nerd out with when talking about these kind of things. Um, so, Rich, and I can you know, please chime in here, uh, but Rich was a football kick or was kicker at Westchester University. He now owns a uh, gym uh, in Bryn Mawr, uh, Spectrum Strength Training, and I, I've been working with him and re referring a lot of runners to him uh, because, again, when I see his programming, I, I've worked with a lot of strength trainers in the past. Uh, good and bad, and and seeing that like Rich is somebody who really really knows his stuff, and and again when I see his programming, see how the, and I, I love I, just one comment real quick was you know Rich was talking about how it's not the exercise but the intent. Well, uh, I forget how you phrased it. Yeah, yeah. So we did one of these talks last week and pretty much just tapped on like it's not the exercise, it's kind of like the principle and like what you're trying to get out of that exercise. Um, I think that kind of relates to running, to really all sports. Um, I think people can get locked in with like this is the best exercise in the world, but they're really just ways to express what you're trying to get out of your training program. So, so, so anyway, so um, you know, and, and so we're, this is fairly informal. So like if there's questions, comments, outbursts, uh, you know, uh, please let us know. And uh, we're gonna kind of start taking this along. We don't have a clicker, so I'm using the keyboard here. And there we go. So kind of, you know, first real quick, kind of the objectives of today. Uh, we want to define what periodization actually means. Like what are, we, what are we talking about when we say creating a periodization plan? We want to look at the, the history of periodization. So it's, it, you, in, as we'll see, it's really interesting to kind of see how this concept of periodization evolved and, and you know came about. Uh, we want to look at periodization concepts and then principles behind 
uh, training periodization. So, right, so one of the first things we kind of look at is, you know, we look at periodization, it really just means we're planning. Uh, so, right, we're trying to prepare or plan for an eventuality, right? So, you know, how, how we kind of go about that. Um, and so, again, periodization really just a fancy way of saying planning. Um, and I thought this was, so Vern Gambetta, somebody I steal a lot of information from, the dude is, is incredibly bright. He's been, you know, in the strength training world. I'm sure Rich has, Rich has heard of him for, you know, over 50 years. But I think the, you know, understanding that periodization is not a scientific concept. Uh, it's just, you know, it's a, a pedagogical construct designed to organize training into manageable periods. And that, like, you know, really all we're trying to do is take, you know, a big idea such as, you know, running a 100 mile race or training for a marathon or, or you know, running under whatever. And then how do we systematically approach that? And how can we break that down into its smaller components and then train those components to kind of culminate uh, into the bigger picture here. Um, sorry, and then Rich, do you, uh, you want to know, I'll still go over this one. So kind of looking at like some key features when we look at periodization. So the first concept is that periodization is a systematic approach. It's not just like a, a like I think the, you know, Rich kind of said like a, a term that you've used is like, you know, we're not just kind of stumbling in the, in the dark. We're not just kind of swinging away uh, at a pinata. Like we're, we're, you know, we have approach. Um, you know, it's a system to distribute training loads in relation to competition, which I think is another really important kind of concept. This isn't like a, you know, there's a beginning and there's an end to what we're doing, you know, so, and then that competition goals kind of defines everything that, that we're, we're going along. There's a defined structure, uh, sequential building blocks, a set time frame, uh, all components of training are addressed uh, in pursuit of a specific goal. Uh, reflects the undulatory nature of the adaptative process, which we'll get into. Uh, systematic manipulation of variables such as volume, intensity, density, uh, and then a method of monitoring training, right? And that's, I think, sometimes we don't kind of, uh, and I wish I put in another slide here that kind of showed how it's a, how it's a feedback loop, right? We, we create a plan, we execute it, uh, we then, you know, see how it, you know, you know how it changed things and then we go back through the process of replanning so it's just kind of like you know uh, wheel there am i missing anything on that no i think you did a really good job with that i think the biggest thing with just periodization is like you have to have like a set time frame like you can't just say i'm going to periodize for like ever you know it has to be like hey i have a marathon coming up in berlin or the philly marathon or something like that how many weeks out am i from that marathon and you know what are some other variables like uh for example like if you work like a nine to five if you're in an accountant and like you're in tax season those are other variables that will affect like how hard you can run how quickly you can recover and things along those lines so i think just the biggest thing is like you just have to make sure there's like a finite time and you have to have a goal and you know when you like you want to peak the athlete for that uh so this was another um the concept of periodization works best when the majority of the variables can be controlled the most important variable is that of competition again using any competition just means you know where's where's our end result that we kind of want to be at that is what you know kind of defines you know how we periodize uh control the competitive schedule is essential to the success of the plan and i love what what yogi Berra says like if you don't know where you're going you'll end up somewhere else uh, so without a plan, well, we're liable to not know where we're going to end up. Um, so I thought that was a good point. So, you know, first thing is kind of talking about the history of periodization. Uh, so this goes all the way back to, uh, well, Greco-Roman times. So Milo of Croton, so like there's the, the famous story, I'm sure, yeah, yeah, like, so, you know, young man, you know, his training basically was that he, you know, would lift a bowl, you know, from infancy. And then as the bowl got bigger, but he would also get stronger. And so this, you know, uh, you know, systematic overload, right? That we are like systematically overloading our body uh, in, in an appropriate manner. So that way it, it gets stronger as we increase the load there. So, you know, so again, kind of looking at how, you know, even back in, you know, before BC, we're still looking at, you know, the concept of periodization and planning. 
So this part uh, I thought was super interesting. So if we look at like where periodization kind of comes from, and we talked about planning, it really stems from like the Russian Revolution. So right, Ruff, Russian Revolution happens. Uh, you know, Russian Revolution then goes ahead and they, you know, the communist system became started going working on a five-year plan. So everything had a five or ten-year plan, whether it was agriculture, uh, the in, you know, industrial. Um, you know, system, and then also with the Olympic system, which they ended up making a, a four-year plan. Um, so, so basically, how the the Soviets kind of looked at periodization was that they were going to control for everything, uh, and they were going to make a plan for everything they did. Um, and so that's where you know, if we look at where periodization kind of came, where the, you know, the current concept of periodization comes out of, uh, this is where it kind of stems from. The other like important point when we look at periodization is that like the the, the modern concept of it, you, know, you also have to understand World War II. So after World War II, if we looked at like the percent of casualties among the population, so Poland had a 17 percent uh, casualty amongst their population. Soviet Union 14, uh, Yugoslavia 11, Germany. So all these Eastern Bloc countries. Um, and especially in their younger male population. And so they had, right, like after World War II, they have substantially less young males, uh, and they had to actually, like when they're, you know, building up basically their, their military, uh, they had to, they, they couldn't afford to waste time or, or not be um, more efficient. And so when we look at like where, like why it kind of came out of the Soviet bloc is because they had to be better with what they were doing. Uh, and you know, right, like the US, we had a 0.3% uh, you know, population of casualty, or, uh, casualties. Um, so when we start to understand that, we start to see that as I go down, um, you know, one of the other things to, to kind of remember is that, you know, these Eastern Bloc countries, when they started creating this concept of periodization, it was to build a strong military. And, and this idea that like by having a fit society, we have a strong military. So a lot of these Eastern Bloc countries started to, and the, and the Soviet Union started implementing these periodized training plans at, for very young ages in order to create this healthy, strong society to create this strong military. And it was the same thing, like the reason that they wanted to be competitive at the Olympic level was to show, you know, this, this mighty strong country and like, uh, you know, this is when we kind of had the arms raised during the Cold War. Um, and it gets into kind of like the, the next, so when we, again, look at the history of periodization, the father of periodization, uh, Mat Matyev, uh, over on the left there, um, he was the first one to kind of start scientific, like having a scientific approach to understanding how training affects the body and how we can better plan for that. Um, and it has its huge limitations as we're, as we're going to see. Um, so so the, the Soviets wanted to be very, very specific and scientific about what they were doing. Uh, and so they, and they wanted to be able to quantify everything. So one of his famous um, you know, which, which many people have seen is that how this is called the X periodization model, uh, which is that basically, you know, volume, you, you, you know, as training goes along, you start with a high volume and low intensity. And then as the training program continues, volume starts to dip and intensity starts to increase. And that if you time it right, you'll have this, this peak in performance. Um, the issue is that uh, simple models are, are oftentimes like not very good. And it, it's super interesting because you know, a lot of where athletes have the biggest struggle is right here. Uh, the number of athletes that will get hurt, and especially with runners once, and because it, it's such a simple model that people try to follow, once intensity starts to increase and volume starts to drop, everyone seems to get hurt right there. Uh, and that's why like the, this model doesn't work and we have to be careful about you know inferring too much um, from something like this uh, you know and then you know kind of oh, sorry real quick going back um, you know the the last thing kind of comment on this was that like I, you know, I hope we're seeing that like when we look at periodization so much of it is cultural and not based you know, if we, you know again understanding 
where periodization model kind of comes from, that it's not, it wasn't built just out of science, it was built out of a culture who needed it, you know, you know wanted to kind of view it that way. Um, and then we also have to understand that, that the periodization models that are created, uh, especially in Eastern Bloc and Soviet programs, uh, are also very uh, drug influenced. So it, was it the, you know, the scientific principles of, and, and not that they weren't, the scientific principles of what makes the athlete better, or were they just following a, you know, a pharmalo pharmacological like program of like, take these drugs in, in this sequential more, mo you know, order. The training, oh, hey, like, is great, but like, it, you know, there was there was a lot of aid going on. So anyway, so this is Barry Bonds doping calendar. So uh, so you follow that, you know, you could probably do whatever you wanted training wise. You, you might you know not that you he didn't work on it, but um, so anyway, so the last uh, you know kind of point behind this is you know understanding the history kind of allows us to look into the future. Um, and and John Kiley has written some some really good stuff. So periodization paradigms in the 21st century, you know, evidence led or tradition driven. Um, you know, he brings up some great points. So one of his that I, I like the most was that like when we look at periodization, so much of it is just about creating variation. And we know that like no one periodization model actually seems to work. What we understand the most is that the body responds really really well to. Um, to variation and you know and, and not monotonous like not doing monotonous things um so he kind of like i think has a a much better understanding and, and, a, and a better approach to understanding how to create a training plan and so you know so his model is you know, having the coaching opinion and perspective uh regular trend analysis and collected data habitual objective and subjective monitoring uh, and funneling all of that into creating where the training is kind of going instead of having kind of this pre-programmed idea and just kind of following along. Um, is this all kind of making sense for the most part? Okay. Um, all right, now that we kind of went over the history, uh, we can talk about some key concepts in training and, and this is where uh, Rich, I'm going to get uh, a little bit more involved here. Uh, Rich, you want to explain this one? Yeah, so pretty much a super compensation curve. It's essentially like whatever you give your body, like it's going to adapt to, right? So like you can either give it a little bit too much, and that's when like you might get hurt or have some like aches and pains in your knees, Achilles, especially in like long distance endurance runners. Um, or you can give it also too little. So this is kind of showing like you want to get right to that point where like your body is forced to adapt but not over. Because like you know, you rather go a mile under than an inch over. Because like a mile under, like you know, you can live to fight another day. But, like, you go an inch over, you might get all these flare ups and tendons, ligaments again. Particularly in like the long distance endurance runners, um, where like your guys' training is ninety percent sport specific. Where like you're probably gonna run all the time. Where like you probably do a little bit of strength and conditioning on the side. Um, so you can get a lot of like those overuse injuries from just doing too much overall volume of work. Whereas. Um, if you kind of give yourself just enough and then you back off and give yourself ample enough time of recovery, that's when you kind of see the adaptations and get like what you want out of your training. And, and I thought like the, the important point, right? Like, so we, we, we create a stimulus, so we have a training session. We, we technically get less fit. Like you have a hard session the next day, like it's hard to run and you're, you're less athletic. You couldn't do, you know, the next day you can't do the same hard session, but with adequate recovery, your body will super compensate for that hard session kind of saying like a you know the body's smart enough to kind of say like ah oh, like i see what you did you fooled me once i'm not going to let you do that again i'm going to super compensate so that way when i have to experience that level of stress i'm going to be prepared for it and if we time it properly uh you know so what we're going to see on the next one you know so rich i'll let you kind of explain this uh yeah, so essentially like you want to keep on giving ample like training stimuluses. So like you'll give you'll give like a training stimulus, like say you ran X amount of miles or like a mile road, you did X amount of reps and sets, right? Your body will go down a little bit, you'll be tired, right? But then you get enough nutrition, sleep, recovery, it'll go back up. And when you get to that point, you change up everything a little bit, it goes back down again, it comes back up, down again, come back up. So like the goal is you always want the upwards trajectory. Um, but it really depends on like the recovery aspect of stuff, which most people aren't very good at stopping or, or slowing down. And that's where like, right, like we can reduce this time period 
by going ahead and just having better on the recovery side of things. Um, you know, what we now kind of look at is that, you know, what we can start to define a little bit is that one of these periods, right? So from a stimulus and, you know, through the response up to the supercompensation is what we can kind of define as like a micro cycle. So, you know, how much time do we need you know, in order to give those appropriate bouts of training in order to optimize this kind of flow. Is that? Yeah, and even to optimize it too, like you really have to train hard enough, right? Because some people don't push themselves hard enough, so like they won't get any type of stimulus. Like if you work out once a week or in once a week, probably not going to get too much right. growth from that or too much. And we'll see. So. And so, and on Rich's point, right? So like if we don't train hard enough, then we won't get, we won't, you know, be dipping down low enough that we won't reach that high super compensation curve. And then on the flip side, if we do overdo it, Rich and correct me if I'm wrong here, we also won't hit that super compensation curve. Right. So you'll constantly, or if you are, you know, let's say I train really hard and then, you know, somewhere in here, I go ahead and I train hard again and then I don't give myself enough time. Now I start trending downwards because I'm never letting my body actually fully adapt to the stimulus. I'm just constantly, you know, hitting it with bouts of training, never allowing it to, to adjust and, yeah. and, and like if you just like keep training way too hard um you go back one more yep. actually so if you just keep training this one if you just keep training way too hard and again like you're not giving yourself enough recovery like you'll stay below that line but most times again you get hurt which is it like i mean if you overtrain, which that's like a word that gets thrown a lot, around a lot it's really just like you're not like you're either working too hard not recovering hard enough um or like you're just not giving yourself enough time again in between to just let those adaptations take place. So like I can shut you down for like a month, two months, where like your body will literally go into shock. Like your nervous system won't really know what's going on and we'll kind of get into stress later on, but like your body can't really tell the difference between stress from work, stress from like your you know relationship or stress from training. So like all those stressors will build up and that's what kind of happens when you're Right, no, no, no. And the last thing I was gonna say, right? Like there's the, the, the end of this, this would be called detraining, right? Like, so we've hit, like, we, this would be our new fitness level. And then if we don't do anything, if we just sit on the couch, uh, you know, eating potato chips, we'll slowly deteriorate back to, to baseline. And so again, kind of going back to, it's all about kind of hitting these in the appropriate time points, each one of these making up what we would call a micro cycle. Um, and this one uh, kind of talking about, right, like uh, everything is kind of dose dependent. Uh, so what is the like appropriate dosage that we want to give for, for any particular stimulus? And, and also understanding that there's, there's diminishing returns, right? So like if I try doing a long run all the time, like there's going to be diminishing returns of, you know, like, you know, how much benefit I'm getting from doing those. And, and so this is just another like important concept to understand is that there is, and, and, we, and we're also kind of what Rich was saying about injury is that we start to, you know, at some point we're starting to switch over in terms of like what you would kind of say like is the like cost benefit analysis of like, you know, hey, like one bout of like, you know, you know, going to the gym three times a week probably really good four times a week, uh, maybe five times. Now, maybe I'm not seeing quite the same amount of benefit that it could be doing. Same thing, like, you know, for running mileage, you know, the difference, and I'll just throw a number out here, the difference between going from 80 to 90, you know, so let's say you're running 80 miles a week and then you're running 90 miles a week. Well, you might see some benefit there going from 90 to 100. Yeah, maybe you're gonna see some benefit, but now we're starting to get a little bit dangerous with like those extra 10 miles now can really start to increase, um, you know, our, you know, uh, we're starting to outweigh, outweigh the benefit compared to the cost of potentially getting hurt. Um, I have two questions. Yeah. So kind of based on, I think it was two slides ago, an original graph. This one. Yeah, that one. So when you talk about super compensation, is that just the act of recovering or, um, like I, I see what you're getting at, but I'm not sure exactly how to pinpoint that word. Pretty much means like you just are more fit than you were previously beforehand. But like okay. you have to let your body, like like your muscles will fatigue way faster than like mm -hmm. your nervous system. So like your nervous system will like take a while to to kind of bring back up um, those like compensations. So like again, mm -hmm. to 
bring it back to like a strength training term. Say like you did 100 pounds on like an exercise, right? And mm -hmm. then you kept on doing that, right? You might get to a point where like you have to take rest time in between, mm -hmm. but then the next time, maybe like four weeks later, if you keep doing that same program and like take ample recovery time, you might be at like 130. So like with running, that could be related to like time, time-based stuff. And, and that's not saying, I think maybe what you're getting at is like, it's not like rest, we'll have to eventually define what rest means, right? Is that like, you know, what is the appropriate level of rest? Like, like is this just you're doing nothing? No, and, and this is where we can start getting into, let's go, uh, kind of go into this is like, you know, so the understanding that like every different stimulus have different compensation curves. So, right, so like if we were to look at, for example, sprint workouts. So they have kind of a compensation curve of looking at about 39 hours. And this is, and this is very, you know, so, so things have different levels of, of, you know, how when you create that stimulus, when we typically see that peak. Uh, um, so and, like super compensation, like when you peak. Okay, yes. Okay, okay. I, I see what you're saying now. Okay. You, um, you yeah, so then, what do you think about polarized training? Like, what I was thinking, looking we're, at that graph. We're going to get into polarized training. Okay, okay. So, um, what am I missing on this? Oh, hold on, let me go back one real quick. Um, you know, and this, this, Rich actually does a really great job of this, of understanding that, like, if we're constantly giving the body the same stimulus, if you're always just doing the same thing, you will eventually just, all you're doing is you're training and then you know, because it's not a new stimulus, your body has nothing to learn how to get better at. Um, so if you, if you view your body as like a, as a problem solver, like it's constantly, look, it's constantly taking in stimulus and trying to adjust. Um, a lack of variation leads to staleness. So, right, so like if we're constantly just doing the same training, we're never going to see changes in, in our body. So, or, or you know, any improvement over time. Um, this kind of just went over talking about how, you know, whether it's strength training, uh, hard sprinting, long runs, VO2 max, lactate threshold, there are so many different types of stimulus that we can create. Understanding how those, what those recovery times tend to look like, and understanding that, you know, how, you know, you know, right, like, if you do, I don't know, Rich, like what would be like your most neurologically taxing, what would take, what do you take the longest to kind of recover from or to start seeing the benefits I mean, from? It really depends on person to person, but like pretty much too much volume or too much intensity. So like if you just do way too much volume, um, it like gets it back. Yeah, no, no, so, so like kind of the question would be like, all right, so let's say you did a hard long run. When can we see the benefits of that long run? And usually you're t looking at the benefits from that long run taking at least you know 10 days before we'll start seeing the benefits of that whereas like you know uh some speed element like when can we start seeing some of the benefits of some of the speed work you're doing that can take a little like we can see that benefit a little bit sooner strength training i think we have to look at I mean, it can take a while. Like I had a, to give you guys an example, I had a pro hockey player I was training and he was doing two a day. So he would come in the morning to me, they would go out and skate, like do like a skill work, come back at nighttime, do that again, do that six days a week, right? So, I mean, you get to the end of a month of, of doing that stuff. I remember we did, so we did like 12 week blocks of training. So by the end of the 12th week, he was just kind of stagnating, like just really at that plateau. So I said, hey man, just, just go on vacation, go away, like take like a week off, just anything but strength training, like just go in the sun, you know, eat really well, just like relax, kind of de-stress, anything away from the weight room. And when he came back, he gained two pounds of muscle, lost 2% body fat, and gained three inches on his vertical, just from giving his body like proper rest and relaxation, and just letting all this stuff take take time, because it does take time, because a lot of it has to do with like, again, like your nervous system, and that just takes time to have those adaptations, you know, take place, so. Does this all make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So now that we kind of understand that everything comes down to kind of that super compensation model, we can now start to break down our training, right? So here we have a one-year training plan, or what you would call a, a macro cycle. So, you know, here's the starting point, and here is our ultimate goal, or our last race, um, right? So we can look at it, 
big, and then we can start to break it down into its chunks. So now we're looking at, and these tend to be, you know, if this is a year plan, these tend to be one month plans, you know, different mesocycles, um, right? That, that also carry different themes to them uh, to kind of help culminate into us being our best here. We can then break down a mesocycle into its microcycles, which are those independent doses uh, that we're, we're kind of giving that kind of, you know, if we say, you know, typically we look at microcycles, typically being seven to 10 days is what we, what we typically look at a microcycle like being. A week, like we can and, and that would be like, you know, you do your long runs on Sunday, you know, and if you're doing that every Sunday, then a microcycle is about a week because it's, it's when you're repeating that stimulus and then, right, so let's say you have a four week block, every week you're doing a specific type of long run, it culminates here, you have a little bit of rest and then you're changing the phase over into, into a new mesocycle. And then below those microcycles, we now have the individual sessions. And that's what you're doing on a day-to-day, -day, you know, if you're doing two-a-days, uh, you know, what your AM session, PM session kind of looks like. So you can kind of see that each of the components, you know, right, we took something big, an annual plan, we broke it up into its month, we broke it up into its weeks, and then we broke it up into its days. And understanding how all of those pieces kind of fit back in together and all serve to get us, you know, from the start over to the finish. Right, yeah, so I mean, like, if you're looking at, like, a year-long plan for, for, like, runners, for example, like, the first block of, like, a month might just be trying to get you, work, like, your work capacity up, like, which helps you with recovery from, you know, one day to the next, and just increasing, like, that overall tank of work that you can perform. Um, so once you get that done, you might, like, in that first cycle, you might increase somebody's flexibility. Like, you're just trying to get their body to adapt to what you're gonna give it in the future down the road. So like if you guys came in and say like your ankle mobility was terrible and like your knees weren't that strong, like, like the muscles around your knees weren't that strong, you want to address that in that first block, right? So maybe you do that for like four weeks, right? Then the next eight weeks you might do like a lot of strength work, right? To prevent injuries, to help out with like your movement efficiency, right? So like every step you're taking, you're not you yeah, no, it's this interesting point because I, I now uh, coach at Westchester University and one of the things is like I'm getting into it late in the games. So we have like six weeks left of the season and a lot of these kids, we haven't addressed some of the issues that we should have done way back here of just building in a better aerobic, like work, what we would call work capacity and injury prevention. Just, you know, what you would call uh, like GPP. Or... Yeah, GPP, anatomical adaptation is the nerd term. But yeah. yeah. Pretty much like you want to address that stuff here. So like by the time you get to like the competition phase, like you're not breaking down or running into issues that it's probably happened months and months prior, but you're just feeling it once you get close to the race, once the intensity and everything starts to increase a lot more. So like these first blocks are super important. And to Colin's point, every mesocycle should build off of the last one. So like pretty much all this in a nutshell, it has to be individualized right to the person, right? If you have bad ankles and you have bad hips, you're not gonna do the same stuff in that first phase, right? But then we get to the next, but like the overall plan though is gonna be similar. Like you might do different exercises back to Colin's first point, like why we don't really focus on exercises because they're individualized. So like you do the exercises that are best for you guys, but the overall plan is to address like issues that you might have with your mobility or work capacity or things of that sort. And the same thing, like if we're looking at from a training, like a running perspective, we might go ahead and say like, all right, during these early blocks, like, all right, like, you know, you just came off of, you just came off of the season, you took some downtime, we're now heading back into a new training cycle. We start with, you know, a couple weeks of just easy mileage, again, building, building volume up, no real sense of intensity or urgency. And then we start, you know, basically creating the body, right? Like, uh, and we'll start getting more into this. We want to create a great foundation, you know, so incorporating different, you know, fartlek sessions, tempo sessions, different types of strides, creating like this robust athlete that we're going to use later on down the met down the mesocycle you know as we're going down these mesocycles into more what we call like specific training so all right hey like i built this great base this you know this great well-roundedness now i want to target this particular thing and i want to funnel that and i have the work capacity to be able to to handle and and recover enough that now i can start to what would be like sharpen the knife uh, of like, all right, now I've got this one specific thing I want to target. And so like having these blocks that kind of build on each other and prepare you in a sequential and appropriate manner so that way you can kind of get to that, that end, healthy yeah. end. I mean, know, like the goal fitness. is to peak like for your competition, right? And too many people blow themselves out early on from like, uh, like I have people, they come to the gym, they're like, I want to do the Broad Street Run and they haven't ran in years, right? So they all of a sudden start running five miles a day, every single day for like, you know, weeks. 
and they come back to like on my knees hurt, I have shin splints. So I'm like, yeah, well, you just did like nothing, and now like your body's not used to that type of stimulus. So like I think this is super super important, and I think people have to understand that like you can save yourself a lot of injury and hassle by focusing on your periodization model in the beginning, so that you can peak towards the end once you get like closer to competition. Uh, this kind of goes over the same thing, and this and this kind of took what we just had and kind of gave it more, uh, you know, some of the terms that we were kind of using, right? So you have this transition phase. So after the count, comp like competitive cycles kind of ended, uh, you know, a period of rest. We then start back uh, in the beginning with grad, or, um, you know, general preparation, specific preparation, pre-competition, and then competition, and how those kind of flow into one another. And again, that's a, that's a very basic uh, way to kind of view it. I'm sure, Rich, you've seen much more complicated. Uh, but those those are some of the ways that we can break apart. The, this would be considered the uh, well, the phases, but also the the, the mesocycles. And then here, you would be put, putting together these weak blocks of microcycles. Does that make sense? So now we're starting to look at you know, another key concept in periodization is called polarized training, and which is becoming, um, you know, a lot more popular of a term. Um, and, and, you know, one of the, the interesting things in, in polarized training is that when we start, so the, this is a graph uh, showing that, you know, you know, we're looking at athletes racing, you know, top performers in the marathon. How much time do they spend at marathon, at marathon specific pace? Well, only 4%. How, many, how much time are they spending at 3,000 to 10,000 meter pace, race pace? 18%. How much are they spending below marathon pace? 78%. Uh, and we start to see that, like, you know, this very interesting, and, and, and you see this a lot in endurance sport. I'm not sure if you see it so much in the sprint, in the, in, well, in the speed uh, power world, um, but a lot of endurance athletes are going to spend a disproportionate amount of time. So it, it kind of follows the 80-20 rule, which is that you spend 20% of your effort at uh, high intensity and then 80% of your effort at kind of these low intensities. Um, you know, you know, and this, these are your recovery runs, your easy runs, your warm up, your cool downs, uh, and everything like that. The interesting part though is that, especially with the marathon, we actually don't spend a whole lot of time at marathon pace we want to be training this realm. Like this is the focus. Uh, and that's because uh, this, this is kind of going a little bit off topic, but the reason is because we get such a big bang for our buck out of this. Training at marathon pace, like marathon pace is like hard enough that it makes you tired, not hard enough to create real adaptation. Uh, whereas training, right, like we're looking at 3000 meter pace. Well, 3000 meter is, is usually the predictor of your VO2 max. So if we're training VO, if we're training 3,000, you know, around your 3,000 meter race pace, we're really putting the demand on your VO2 max system, which is going to create a huge benefit. When we're looking at 10,000 meters, well, 10,000 meters, we're starting to get close to the lactate threshold, where your, you know, where your peak lactate threshold is going to be. So that's the marker. Your your marathon pace is not really an indication of anything physiologically. So spending time there, what what tends to happen is athletes tend to bulk up in the middle here. So they spend too much time in what's called like the gray area. So this, this concept of like you're training hard enough to make, your t make yourself tired, not hard enough to really create adaptation. Uh, and there was another really interesting study that showed that like in, in top performers, um, you saw like so the difference between sub elite and elite was that sub elites were spending so much time in this gray area. Uh, and so what we tend to see in, in polarized training is that the fitter you get, so if we kind of look at like a, I wish I put this up on the graph, uh, kind of like a um, that V shape, uh, the fitter we get, the harder our hard training has to be, but then our easier our easy training has to be because in order to, right, if we kind of go back to this, or let's go this, right? As we're getting fitter, we have to, we have to create really, really hard training in order to elicit the appropriate super compensation curve. So, right, like very fit athletes have to do incredible workouts in order to get that, that, that appropriate time to respond. But in order to do that, right, like when you're way up here and you have to like, you know, create that curve, that means way down here, you really need to let your body adequately recover. And if you don't, 
right? Like if you, if you, again, if you, you know, have this really hard training session and, and a lot of athletes fall into this trap of thinking like, oh, well, cause I'm fitter. I should be able to take my easy runs harder. It's like, no, cause all you're doing is now, you know, making that polarized training and now you're spending more time in that gray area. And so again, like the, a lot of East African athletes will talk about how, you know, Westerners, you know, Richard's heard me say this, their hard days are too easy and their easy days are too hard. You're spending too much time in the middle. Whereas if you if you spent time in Kenya or Ethiopia, uh, what you'll see is that they their hard days are awesomely hard. Their easy days are incredibly easy. It's just like a complete shuffle. And and like and that's we'll get into that because it's not a concept that we entirely have to like go into because uh, I do think a lot of us, what we're still working on is just our work capacity. Like in order to be able to train that hard, you have to have great, really, really great work capacity. Like if you tried doing some of their workouts, you'd be trashed for, you know, two weeks, which is like, well, that kind of defeats the purpose. Is this kind of- Yeah, so how do you build work capacity? So actually, yeah, I don't think I've got a slide on that, but uh, we can yeah, talk but, a bit about know, that. Yeah, I mean, you wanna start off, right? Yeah, so like work capacity is really about like, right? like. At some point, and I do have one slide that talks about work capacity, but when we when we think about that, it's like your ability, it's just your ability to do work. And we can define that in so many different ways. Like, you know, just, just you know, uh, for instance, like, uh, you know, there's an ath you know, athlete uh, we had who, you know, at some point I had, we kind of had to have the conversation of like, you know, going for a three mile run, like if all you're doing is 20 minutes of exercise, and not saying that that's, you know, but if the, if the goal was, you know, these bigger things, like I just have to ask, like if you're only doing 20 minutes, and, and, and if it, it's fine if you can only handle 20 minutes of running, but what about all the other stuff? What about the, you know, strength training, the yoga, the cross training, all these other things that just kind of make you a well-rounded athlete uh, that also serve, right? Like, you know, there's 24 hours in a day, like you're, Ability to just work um, is how I define work capacity. Uh, like your ability just to do general circuits. Like there's so many ways that we can just improve your, that will translate eventually into being able to handle specific loads or you know very specific training. Mm -hmm. Um, but at some point, and again, I'm yeah, like, I mean, going back to like the example of like the cash potato trying to run the Broad Street, like. They had no work capacity, that's why they're getting injured because like their tissues and muscles, they aren't ready for the demands that they're putting on them. But like when you build that up, you're pretty much like building up your engine, like your, your gas tank, right? So like the bigger the gas tank, the more fuel you can put in there, the farther you can go. If you have a small gas tank, you're probably not gonna go too far. So like when you, th that was like the first phase we were talking about, like just circuits, trying to build up like your aerobic base. Um, like again, in, in my world, in like the strength and conditioning world, like I have some people that come to the gym they might do two exercises and like they're almost passed out, right? But like they, they might do like very basic stuff, but they have no work capacity. So like something as simple to me as that to them is like super hard. And I love Rich. Rich and I had this conversation because you were talking about football. Like you know, and I, I was curious about like oh, like how do footballers, the pro football players, play? You know, train. Well, they're you know each play lasts what three to five seconds. So you would think like very short, very like they just need to be explosive and everything like that. But Rich brought up the great point is like, well, they have to be able to do that for 16 weeks. Right. So they have to actually have a pretty good work capacity mm -hmm. in order to just last that long and to recover, you know, week to week to be able to continue. And so like that general work is still all about just, you know, so you think you still think of like these like, you know, oh, they don't need to be doing, you know, circuits or endurance work. And you're actually like, well, actually, no, they still do because there's still some element of recoverability. And so, and you would argue that recoverability is this, you know, you know, work capacity kind of area. It's like, you know, you can, you can only, you can only tolerate what you can recover from, right? Um, right, and then like the higher your work capacity, you can recover quicker from like day to day, which means that you can work out harder more frequently. So like, I mean, they're like, like for example, Bulgarian weightlifters back in the day used to work out like five, six times a day. So like their sessions would be short, but they would literally work out, they would eat, they would sleep, and then do that again all throughout the day. So like their frequency of workouts were so high, even though they were short, but like the work capacity and their ability to like tolerate just handling like workloads and volumes is so high that again, they recover quicker and they can just do more in, in the average day. And, so, and this is you know, currently a situation that I see is, is with some uh, 
you know, athletes as like, you know, the 800 meter runners. And you would think again, like, oh, these kids need to be fast. But watching, I'm, I'm watching some of their training and sometimes I'm reflecting on the fact that I'm like, look, like, like we, like, it's not that they need more speed. It's not that they need more, you know, intense training at a specific pace, you know, they just need to increase their work capacity. We just aren't even fit enough to tolerate the demands of the sport yet. And we haven't developed the qualities of just a well-rounded athlete in order to start targeting being a really good 800 meter runner, 1500 meter runner, 1400 or 400 meter runner. Does that all kind of make sense? Like, yeah. you know, and that's, and that's, you know, so I think uh, what you were kind of saying there in terms of like understanding work capacities is, is this, and we're gonna get into it of like, how we need to understand what it means to be an athlete. Um, and we'll, we are going to touch back on that. Um, so like building base miles kind of. Yeah, base, but example. we can we can think even broader than that. Um, so base miles, yes, but like there's the concept like long, slow distance makes long, slow runners. Um, you know, we want to be thinking about, and, and this is where Rich's world makes so much sense, is how do we make a better athlete? Like uh, we're going to, we're going to touch more on that. Um, so last thing about kind of the polarized training. Uh, so Phil Bowerman, uh, like, like, you know, uh, track coach from the sixties, uh, kind of learned this instinctually. Like he didn't have to be told like worse. Now there's a, there's a professor out at in Finland who's kind of helped create a lot of research talking about polarized training, but Bowerman was the first per one of the first one of them to kind of come across with this hard easy hard easy principle uh, so instead of doing a hard day every day that you had a hard day followed by a recovery day and especially in the endurance world hard day um and so and you know his comment on improvement is made by the man who works the most intelligently and i think understanding that you know the ebb and flow of, of uh you know hard training recovery and like the like like the easy training fuels your hard training, right? So you can't just go like hard, hard, hard all the time. Like it, it goes like for anything in life. If you just work 120 hours a week every single week, you're probably going to be in the hospital or be burnt out, right? So like you just have to make sure that like your easy training, like Tom said, is super easy, but that'll fuel your hard training. I think it's tougher mentally for most people to be like like good with their workout for that day, and like you kind of need to not more here. But yeah, I think it's I think it's this interesting idea of like you tend to see it and like how much of it comes to our like our security within ourselves because it's usually like when we have that fragile ego or that fragile like i don't believe in myself that i can't allow myself to rest and in the belief that like i you know and and you tend to see it in the the athletes who are super secure in themselves or su have these like really good sense of self they can trust that like i can take a day easy like i can and that's why i think you see on you know especially with some of the east african athletes and 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 high performers is that they they have such great self belief that they are able to just let themselves rest. Whereas what and again what separates the sub elite from the elite is I feel like sometimes the sub elite athletes and having been there myself is that you you just are maybe a little bit more insecure about your place and so you constantly just think oh, I need to go I need to push I need to push and you never allow for that like and again I think it's sometimes in, yeah in the but head. I think it goes back to like the quality over quantity debate where like you can keep on doing more but like you're just doing work to do work or like you're doing work that's actually going to get you better so like all the pro people I train that are later in their careers like they just have really intense like focus sessions right so like one basketball guy I train would come in 30 45 minutes of like intense work he gets out, he's in cryo, he's in the sauna, he's doing something to recover so we can do that again on the basketball court. So like to relate that to running, right? Like And we're gonna no, we're gonna go over that in a sec in a little bit, talking about, you know, understanding the difference between like chronological age and biological age and understanding that that process there. But like right, like it, and what he what he kinda said, like is this are we training to train or are we training for a purpose? And that's the difference between periodization, is understanding that you know, if we're out there training and you're just doing it just for the sake of training, well then we might be missing the point here. Because again, everything we're supposed to be doing is supposed to have some kind of like purpose or intent to it to kind of get this to this like ultimate level. And I think that's another thing is like we can sometimes fall into the trap of just exercising for the sake of exercise instead of um, yeah, having the purpose behind it. Everyone good so far? Questions? Is this, is this <laughs> too much? We are, are we okay? Yeah. Awesome. All right. So now we're getting to the next, uh, and this is now we're going to start looking at maybe some more anecdotal stuff and some kind of, you know, unique 
ish things to kind of keep in mind and consider. Um, the first thing is to, to think about the law of practice. So the law of practice basically says that when we start something, we see benefit, and it's kind of talks about like diminishing returns a bit, but you know, we see huge improvement. Uh, as we become more experienced, uh, we're starting to look for more and more just gradual or marginal gains. And what's important about this is that we have to understand where we fit on the curve. So I've never, don't know a musical instrument, uh, never been good at it. But like I imagine if I actually had some kind of formal instruction on playing the piano, I would see huge benefits pretty quickly because uh, I'm terrible to begin with, right? But after years and years of training, you know, now, like now one, I'm, I'm way up here and I'm just trying to get like a half of a percent better. And that takes, and, and the difference, uh, you know, and, and Rich can speak to this more than I can in some ways, is that like, um, you know, the difference is that when we're down here, I can also say like, if I'm trying to play the piano, I just need to sit in front of a piano and play. And I can, and, and honestly, like, there's, there, there's so much room for uh, variability or like, right, like it's, if you're doing, if you, you know, if your goal is to run a, a mile, you know, and just run a mile, well, there's many different ways that we can kind of go about that approach. We can, for the most part, you can bike and see, you know, or, you know, you can spend a lot of your time cross training with very little focus on running and, you know, complete a mile. If we have, you know, if we're way up here, we have to be much more targeted about what we're trying to go for and the, and the, the specificity of it. So like, I can no longer, so like at some point, biking has no more, you know, sorry, I pointed out that way that there was supposed to look out there. Um, biking now has no, wasn't going to transfer to me being a better runner anymore because it's not specific enough. Uh, does that kind of make sense or, or yeah. kind of fit in? So like, and again, like we, you, know, we, you have a young athlete who's getting new to it and, or you have a beginner high school runner, you can more or less throw whatever you want at them and they're going to see improvement in their 5K. Once we get to the college level, professional level, whatever, now I have to be a lot more targeted and specific uh, about what training I'm implementing because because um, the body's just more experienced. Yep, that is so true. Like, I mean, for example, in my world with like athletes, what got you from like your JV team to varsity won't get you to college, and that won't get you to the pros. So, like, you have to keep on kind of sharpening the axe, so to speak. Um, but again, like, I mean, if I get a, a ten-year-old that comes in, you can give them anything they're gonna get stronger, but like when you get a 25 year old that comes in that's been training for 10, 15 years, and they have all that experience underneath of them, you have to really get to the nitty gritty of like, why aren't they progressing? What's gonna take them to the next level? And the same thing with running, like what got you to 430, why not get you to 415 or something like that, right? And, so. Yeah, and it brings up these great points, like these two things, like, you know, it's like you can get all these like, right, you can pay to go get lactate testing, VO2 max testing, all stuff like that. And at the high school level, I just have to say like, there's really no need to because like we're not looking like we can do whatever and still get better let's say you're again now you're a 35 year old you know trying to take off whatever you know 30 seconds in a marathon like now we have to start analyzing like all right what is the what is you know what things are limiting you now we have to start looking at oh is it is it your lactate threshold is it your vo2 max is it your you know uh rate of force development or whatever um and then the other thing that Riff is pointing out is that like, I think it's a great example of like what what made you up to here is it necessarily what's going to take you to that next level. So yeah, a really good example of this is that uh, uh, New Zealand Athletics did research into trying to figure out you know what made what was the difference between you know 800 meter runners at World Championships. What's the difference between the finalists and the medalists? And they found that the medalists were the ones that had the best absolute speed. So they just had, in fact, they just had better maximal velocity. Um, so, right, so things like VO2 max, lactate threshold, running economy, yes, that's what helped you get to the finals of the race, but it's not what got you the medal at the race. And so being able to define that is really important when we're starting to get to these very, like, specific top of the world. And again, understanding where you fit on that curve in terms of like, hey, like, I'm, you know, I'm down here, don't have like I can be more creative and have more fun I'm up here all right I really need to be more targeted and more focused with what I'm with what I'm trying and like I'll get, I need to be more 
laser precise or that is a term that I think yeah. I've heard you I mean, use. Again, like, like you get like a, like, like an 18 year old kid, you can get them to increase their bench press 100 pounds in like six months, right? Or like a year or something like that because if they haven't done it before, it's just so novel to them. But like you get professional power lifters to go from 600 or like 500 to like 505, it could take them a whole year of training just to get those five pounds. But to them, it's like a huge accomplishment because like, you know, it takes that much work to get. And, and the other thing, off oh, your point though, is, is this, this flip of like right like once you start getting to that more experienced realm like i've heard you kind of talk about how like because the body now is so good at adapting to a stimulus you have to constantly be throwing it new and novel stimulus like right like at some point the bench press just isn't novel enough but like there's so many ways that you can create variation within yeah, that right can, like you can incline decline you can put them on the floor different types of barbells you can put chains on top of the barbells bands i can go on and on but like you just have to keep getting and then it goes back to principles like you know you're gonna do clusters which is like you do something really heavy rest a little bit do that over and over again so you have to get really just like reach deep into your bag of tricks to certain people that like you have to really force their body into adaptation where like it's kind of stubborn at a certain yeah. point but then like to your point of understanding like the principles of like all right i'm doing this exercise for this athlete because this is what is limiting is limiting his performance in terms of getting to that next level um so right now we're kind of getting into uh, the next thing to kind of consider is our biological versus our chronological age. So our chronological age is just you know how many years we've you know been around the sun. Our biological age is now looking at both our training age and like our, our maturation level. So right, like you've got two 14 year olds. Well, one of them might be a grown like a, a grown man, and the other one might be still kind of in that like. So how you train those is very different how we would periodize training is very different in the same way though if we look at you know a more you know an athlete who's been training for you know as we were talking about in the last slide someone who's new versus someone who's been training for 20 years we need to have a different approach in terms of how we're going to train them uh and then the last point kind of there was no i kind of forget but uh anything that i'm, I'm I don't know, just to, to piggyback off that, like training age is super important because even if you're 45, right, you never touched anything in your life or ran ever, like you're going to have to treat them like they're like a 14 year old or somebody that's brand new because you can't just be like, oh, you're older or like you've been around the block longer. Like we can just put you into like the meat and potatoes of training. You still have to kind of assess them and ease into all that stuff. But it, it, it also is this interesting point too of like, especially as we age of understanding, and I think. Uh, we can all sometimes fall into the trap of being like, oh, yeah, no, I'm still in my early 20s, my mid 20s, and not understanding that, you know, hey, like now that I am, you know, especially from a physiological standpoint, I am a bit older, having to understand that recovery starts to play a bigger deal. I, I love, like, so one of the reasons I think Med Kofleski did so well uh, is because as he and, and was able to carry on for so long is that he started to understand that, like, hey, he was a 209 marathoner. Uh, now the emphasis started to be on him recovering as he was getting older, recovering well, so that way he could keep being a 209 marathoner. Uh, and the emphasis just, just changed a little bit more. So we, so he changed, he, instead of having a, a seven day cycle, you know, micro cycle, he switched to a 10 day. So he was doing his long run every 10 to 14 days instead of seven. And it's this interesting concept of like, you know, when we get older, like, you know, hey, like if you've got 20 years of experience behind you, like, and this is true for distance runners as it is for throwers. So like if I, if I were to use like a, like a hammer thrower, look like you've thrown, you know, if you're like a 40 year old hammer thrower, you've thrown the hammer so many times. To go ahead and say that you need to keep doing the, the volume might not be what's important. It's just about hitting these like very specific, as long as I can keep touching on the quality, I can maintain my you know level of fitness. I don't have to keep you know, hammering down the volume because my body, you know, your body can't keep doing that because we're just older, like. Yeah, I mean, just, like when I was like a college punter, right, I would be punting like 60, 70 balls a day, or like sometimes 100, which is ridiculous. So like you go to watch, like I went to like watch pro and they did 10 punts and that was it. And like, they just kind of get what they got to do. They know what they have to do to keep their, you know, form and everything in shape. And then they just get out and just get ready for the next day. So it keeps them fresh, it keeps them recovered and they keep making progress. But also, like, staying healthy is the most important thing, right? You don't want to burn yourself out and just run yourself into the dirt. And I think it's, like, the, the interesting point of, like, uh, once we, you know, get up to that level, like, maintaining a level of performance is a lot easier than, than getting up there. Um, 
And, but once you're there, again, like as long as we can be specific about it, you can, and that's why I think we're seeing, you know, athletes aging better, like, you know, Roger Federer, Tom Brady, Mev Kofleski, whoever it is, like that they're competing well into their 40s now, which is like a fairly newer concept that we, we're not seeing as much. And I think they're understanding, one, rest a lot better, and also understanding that, hey, they might not be doing the volume that they used to be doing when they were in their 20s, but they're still able to let, maintain some level of intensity. Um, does that all kind of make sense? Oh, I wish this showed this a lot better. I can send out these slides to you guys. So the other interesting thing is understanding that, you know, right, there's 24 hours in a day. And so we have to start viewing ourselves as being a 24 hour athlete. Um, and we want to take advantage of the body's internal clock, right? So if we can, if we can capitalize on that, so there's a reason that like, Hey, at midnight, strength training might not be the best thing. Like, like going out there and lifting a bunch of heavy weights might not be the best thing for you. Hormone, like, like in terms of getting a proper hormonal response. In the same way, like trying to run, doing sprints at four o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning might not be the best because our, our, our you know, uh, oh, what's the term I'm looking for? Um, we're just not awake enough, right? And you have to, like your body follows these very natural circadian rhythms uh, and we can take advantage of those uh, by going ahead and right like that going here kind of says like two o'clock or, or so is when we kind of hit like our peak alertness um, and so those are prime times to do certain types of training um, what am I missing on that? I think that was that was great I think we're all just creatures of habit and like you want to make your body well oiled machine so like if you keep on you know if you're going to bed at one o'clock one night and then you're bed at like eight o'clock the next night it just keeps on kind of messing with that and can't get on a good rhythm and that might be the day where you wake up and you're like I don't know why, but I'm just groggy today. I don't, I don't feel like I'm at 100%. But that even goes into the weekends, right? So like some people are great from like Monday to Friday, but then you're out till 3 a.m. and many on crushing car bombs or something like that, right? And then the next morning or the next two days, your training suffers and you're almost like making up for that lost time. So I think it's just trying to maintain like, you know, and being realistic with yourself, like like what, when can I get to bed? Do I have a family, do I have kids and things like that? Um, but then finding time to wind down at the end of the night and then kind of rising at the same time of the day uh, will really just put yourself in the best position to keep on like progressing. Going back to like the super compensation stuff, right? You want to make sure that like you're not burning yourself out, but like that circadian rhythm is super important to making sure everything's just working the right way. And your body gets adjusted to like whatever like the repeated stimulus you're kind of giving it. So like, right, like you can you can get into the habit of going to bed at eight o'clock, waking up at four. It takes a little bit of an adjustment, but then your body will naturally, right? Like you ever get to the point where like you always just wake up five minutes before your alarm. And it's just because like your body has figured out like eh, about this time I'm supposed to start waking up. Uh, and that's that's completely hormonal. Uh, yeah, that's so. people that like wanna sleep in on the weekends, but they're used to waking up at 4.30 and they just keep waking up at 5 a.m. with sad and they're just like, man, I can't, even, I can't even sleep in, you know? So it's just your body just kind of on that. But that, like, that's a good thing though, right? So like that means your body's on like really in tune with itself. And there's interesting stuff like, like uh, there was a study talking about flight attendants and how right the constant changing of of time zones how that affects their like circadian rhythms like like wildly uh, and all the like kind of like the ramifications for that so their cortisol levels were a lot higher and you know or their stress levels and things like that and it's all because like their body could never find like was never in you know a proper you know found a, a natural flow was constantly just and, and that affects how we kind of look at periodization um, I kind of threw this one in but I, I think it's another really important point so if we look at the bottle body having its own circadian rhythm you know the world also has its like natural flow and I think we also want to kind of take advantage of uh, the seasons and how you know life around us kind of changes so the, and the two quotes I kind of throw on here um, uh, there are, ha there are flowers in spring, breezes in summer, moon in autumn, snows in, and snows in winter. Uh, and right, that's just always that cyclical nature, um, right? And change is the only constant uh, in life. And so, and, and we, we wanna take advantage of this, right? Like it's this really interesting thing. So typically, like let's say we're doing marathon training. We usually typically peak in the spring and then in the fall. Uh, right, the summer, oh, it's always hot. You know, winter, it's always cold. But those are like great moments to be doing our base mileage because you know, we don't need to have these like, you know, super, as I'm going the wrong way, uh, these super specific kind of training. And this is where the weather turns into like these like 
perfect moments where we actually get to feel and run fast. But there's a, there's a time for every season um, and we can match training to kind of go along with that. So like if you are running the Boston Marathon in two weeks, well, this is a great area to train. Like, you know, hey, like yesterday with or you know, whatever it was, we had those like, you know, snow squalls. Like, well, that's actually really good stuff to train through because you don't know what Boston Marathon is going to kind of look like. Uh, and you know, you could have like a super windy day in Boston. So like, you know, how we can kind of take advantage of those things uh, in, in terms of periodizing things properly uh, and using the environment around us. I think too much often we want every day to look the same. And I always feel bad for like California athletes because like, uh, like, hey, like if I'm training in San Diego, like, you know, like I've never had to like train through adversity or, or I get to like, you know, here's this great area we actually get to experience the seasons. Uh, and it forces us to change and adapt and, you know, uh, think outside the box a little bit. So anyways, I, I just thought that was an important point to kind of go along. This, I'll let uh, Rich kind of take away because he's touched on it before. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, just to piggyback off what we talked about earlier, like your body can't tell like what the stress is, but like if you have too much stress, it's, it's going to adapt to that, right? So again, like whatever you give to your body, it's going to be forced to adapt to. So like whether it's your sleep, and like you're only getting four hours of sleep a night, you're like in a crappy relationship or getting divorced or something like that, you know, something going on at work, your nutrition's not on point, um, just whatever it is, like finances, all that stuff adds up. And I think you really have to take that into account and be realistic with yourself. Like, maybe like I like for college kids, maybe I have four finals, probably not the best time to run 100 miles this week, you know, when I'm, when I'm going out. Um, so I think it's just something to keep in the back of your head of like, for again, periodizing your training, if you're an accountant or something like that, right? And you know, this is your busy season you're just not gonna be able to run and train as hard as if you've ever done that, right? And that goes for pretty much all sports and, you know, all cycles. And I, and I think it's this, you know, important point of saying that like training is stress, but stress isn't just training. And, and work, you know, training is about managing and optimizing stress. And so, and so understanding that like, yes, while on paper, it would be nice for you to hit this volume, this intensity, whatever. We have to understand that like, hey, we have, you know, we all have lives. We don't live in a bubble, and that's and that's. I should have brought that up earlier. It's like sometimes when we're trying to look at you know studies or, or gross generalizations, those are things that are done in the lab. You know, in silos. You know, we live in a real world where there's chaos. And understanding that, like, you know, when you don't get a good night's sleep or, or a repeated bad night's sleep, if you are going through a breakup or things like that, that's going to affect your training. And to you know to take account for that and, and understand that hey like that's a normal thing uh and not to kind of like sometimes i think stuff we, we take training plans and say well it, this is the way it needs to be and that's just not the way that it works so you got to be able to be like molded because like you know nothing prepares you for like a client that's on a great training routine and then a tree falls on their house or something because of a storm it's probably going to put some different stressors in their life and kind of back them off a little bit so like you can't be stuck in like your periodization i think to colin's point like the simple method and like the simple model just isn't always the best because like we're complex human beings and nothing in life is that simple so like you're always going to have things that pop up um, we kind of have to adjust for uh this one kind of kind of goes across with, with what we talked about with with uh, uh polarized training right is is the look between so you have your parasympathetic and your sympathetic nervous system uh so one is your your flight and fight and flight response your other is your rest and digest uh, and, and training is about this interplay between the two. We, we create a hard training, which is we create stress, fight or flight, and then you know we want to then, as quickly as we can, tap into, oh, am I gonna get this right? The parasympathetic? No, sympathetic. Sympathetic. Uh, of rest and digest. And the, and the sooner we can, right, like after a hard training session, the sooner that we can tap into that parasympathetic nervous system of getting the body to relax, the quicker we're going to create uh, recovery in order to now attack and then have another hard training bout. And it, but it's this, it's this flow between the two. Uh, and so, and, 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 you know, this interesting thing, so heart rate variability is the, the measuring of the, the differences in the, the time between each heartbeat. Um, and you want to see more variation and when there isn't usually means that you're just stuck in the sympathetic nervous system So you're just constantly in this state of tension and your body just doesn't know how to relax um, So it's, it's really important to kind of understand that it's, it's about the flowing into one 
out of it and into the other and, and fully and never spending too much time just in the, the mm -hmm. fight or flight. Like this is like if you're always here, you'll get burnt out like when you just go, go, go. But like you make all your progress pretty much when you're here. So like it's like when you weight train, like you don't get bigger or stronger in the session. You get bigger and stronger days later once you relax and sleep and stuff like that. Really no difference in, in running, right? Like you have to do the time to back off and know when to like shut it down. And that could be different for people, you know, for everybody. For me, it could be reading or going for a hike. For some people, it could be just sleeping and doing nothing all day. Um, but you just can't always be on like the go, go, go. Otherwise, like you just can't make any progress. And I think that, especially in the endurance world, where I think we have this tendency of go, 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 more, 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 we do get stuck on this side of the equation, and we never fully let ourselves learn how to rest and digest in order to reap the benefits. And I think it's just amazing to see like all the hard work that athletes can put into and wonder why we're not getting the results. And it's like, no, it has to do a lot with, with this half. Um, uh, another important point, this kind of gets into like why individualization is really important and why we need to look deeper into any research that's being put out there, uh, is talking about the difference between responders and non-responders. So you might have like a training, or a training study or anything like that might say that like, yes, as a generalization, we saw improvement, but how an individual, the, the how much they improve is very independent. Uh, and so understanding, you know, uh, so much of periodization is about, also about understanding what the athlete responds well to and what they don't respond well to and understanding that every athlete is just an individual. Um, yeah, and again, like, I think, so I, there's an MMA guy I train, right, and, and he pretty much could, you know, if he sniffs a barbell, he can gain two pounds of muscle. Like, he just is, like, really fortunate like that, right? If, if, if I do the same workouts as him, I probably would get half the progress. So, like, you just have to know, like, what works for you and, and not, like, I think everyone looks to the top, like, oh, well, LeBron James does this, so I have to do that for my basketball game. But he's the exception, not, not like, the end-all, be-all. So, like, you have to find out what works for you. It's just so many different variables. Yeah, and there's like, and it's across everything. Like some people respond really well to altitude training. Some people you get a negative response from, uh, and that just comes down to physiology. And some athletes will like respond really well to a certain type of stimulus. Others won't. Like, will get a like negative or no stimulus at all. And so, kind of figuring out, you know, this kind of gets into the the next graph of like, you're right. Like a lot of studies will talk about like a generalization. But it's really important to kind of figure out where we kind of fit on the bell curve, um, right? Like, uh, you know, and, and kind of what I wrote down at the bottom, what makes an, an athlete exceptional is that they are the exception. So, right, so like some of these, like, you know, uh, well, this research says this. Well, yeah, that works for maybe the general population. But we're talking about, you know, what makes, you know, the exceptional athletes exceptional is that they're already way out here. So they don't fit the norm. And so where do we fit? in terms of like anything. Like we might not be somebody who responds well to high volume. You know, we might be a negative responder to that and or we might be someone who doesn't res responds really well to short intensity. So kind of figuring out like where we fit on general bell curves, uh, I think is another just really important yeah, point. And I think it's really important too to, to, to piggyback off that is like you have to measure all this stuff because like what gets measured gets managed, right? So like if you don't, like do your training log or like if you're not writing down your miles and stuff like that like you know say like you know all of a sudden your knee flared up you can go back at least and be like ah this week i did way too much and i was working this many hours it's probably why i got hurt so i think that's like that's the whole point did we okay so far i think we're, we're almost there so um another important part in periodization this kind of gets to we're going to start getting to some of the things we talk about work capacity um uh, but before work capacity, you know, there's certain things, foundations we need to lay before we can kind of uh, go forward. So when we're kind of looking at how those mesocycles kind of build across each other, you know, we want to look at speed before speed endurance. We look at strength before creating strength endurance. We want to like so, and the, and the idea is that we you need to create the qualities you want, and then you learn to endure those qualities. So let's say you want to break, you know. 30 seconds in the in the 200. Well, if you can't break 15 seconds in a fit, or, or say 60 seconds in a in a quarter. Well, if you can't break 30 seconds in a two, you need to create that quality for first before you can learn to extend it. Uh, and the same thing, like you can't go ahead and expect somebody to, you know, bench press this amount that many times if they first can't do it once. Uh, so I, it always comes quality before quantity. 
uh, in that regard. Yeah, that right? I think, yeah, I mean, I think you just have to be able to walk before you can fly type of thing, right? Like you can't just get off the couch and start sprinting, you have to build up to that, so. This gets into kind of talking about work capacity. Uh, so, right, so here we have, you know, so kind of thinking about a, like a water fountain, um, you know, here's the training going down. How big is that bowl? Right, and that's what we want to look at when we talk about work capacity is how much work can I tolerate? And if your you know, the training is too high and now we're getting this overflow, that's the issue is that we just don't have, the, the issue is that we just need to create a bigger role. Um, yeah, so work capacities are, are just our ability to handle training. And that stuff just comes down to kind of like foundational work. And this kind of starts to lay some of the groundwork of what periodized training or what, what uh, work capacity kind of means. Um, so one of the uh, key concepts is, is uh, are we shooting a cannon from a canoe? Um, so right, so like if I, you know, I can't tolerate work if I have a bad technical model. Um, so right, so if I, you know, have bad mechanics when I'm running, I can't build on that uh, because basically I'm, I'm shooting a cannon from a canoe. I can get really, really strong but all that means is that like when I go to move, I'm gonna create these very violent uh, movement patterns or these improper movement patterns that are just gonna get me hurt. So we have to create that, that strong foundation uh, before we can kind of build off of that uh, and, and actually build a, a bigger engine. Um, yeah, I think like to, for like strength training is so important for runners because again, like there's such good research on people that have like, like the most common injury for marathon runners is knee pain, kneecap pain, uh, closely followed by shin splints and ankles. Um, but if you, if there's great research, so like if you do three weeks of like a hip strengthening and core musculature program, you can pretty much get rid of that and improve like your mechanics and also decrease the amount that your knee goes side to side, right? So that's what gets a lot of runners an issue when they have like that knee variability. So like every stride is a little bit different and the knee's not supposed to go like that, right? It's just supposed to go forward and backwards. Um, but just doing basic stuff like creating a good foundation of core, hips, ankles, flexibility, it'll just take all your marathon stuff to like the next. So right, so I can, you can get as strong as you want, but if you don't address the stability issue, then you're not really like it doesn't like again the concept of you're, you're just shooting a cannon from a canoe um and this kind of gets you know back to to what you're saying so we have you know ash neaton on the left uh a high school runner with looks like shin splints on the right um we want to be well-rounded athletes before becoming highly specific athletes or highly specialized athletes would be a better term uh we need to create this this robustness and and we kind of like you know, do I have it later? No. Uh, so, right, like before really like the Industrial Revolution, uh, before World War II, we all kind of grew up on farms. We all were like, you know, lifting hay bales and carrying, you know, uh, you know, dairy milk and all of these, like, you know, we, we just had this very robust movement patterns. And that's why you saw athletes didn't need to actually spend that much time in the weight room or didn't have to focus on these, you know, other skills that we now have to focus on just because we have much more sedentary lifestyles. Um, but when we create that well-roundedness, we then can specialize in wherever we want to go. Uh, and this is why, like usually, you know, one of the issues we see now is that athletes are specializing too early uh, and they haven't created that. So this kind of gets into, into this, um, is that like, right, like we have the foundational movement, functional performance, and then sports skill. We need this part first. Uh, and so that's why like, you know, you know, and there's, there was a study that showed that like, you know, division one athletes, the number of them that, that didn't become sports specific until 11th, 12th grade uh, was a lot higher. So athletes who specialized at eight year olds didn't go off to become, you know, world renowned because they never developed these foundational movement skills. And you're seeing this even at the elite level of athletes who need to, you know, these, you know, sure, Rich County kind of, sometimes sees it with like, you know, these elite athletes come in and they don't know how to move properly. And that's just an injury. Like if we look at, especially in the endurance world, it's about staying healthy for three, four, five, six years. Uh, and if you can't move well, then again, we don't have that good foundation. We will eventually get hurt. It's not a matter of like if, kind of like a matter of when. Um, which one am I missing on that? Oh, no, no, I think that was great. I mean, like I have kids that come in and like, the ones that say the healthiest are, and are the best athletes are the ones that are three sport athletes, right? They'll do like, you know, football, then basketball, and then baseball, right, or something like that. And then 
once they get older, they just have such a good base and coordination level that they can pretty much do whatever they want. Once they get to college, they can kind of choose what they want to do, um, and their injury risk is just way lower because they've just been exposed to more. And like re theoretically, as we mature as athletes, and we've created this very strong foundation, we can spend more time up here. Only always going back to this, there's a a really good uh, strength coach who works with uh, with the UMRC of Oregon and then also with the uh, uh, Nike, uh, farm, uh, used to be the farm team, uh, Jimmy Radcliffe, talks about, you know, every athlete when they start the season do these foundational movements. And you, regardless of how good you were or are, you always come back to these foundationals, even if it's just a refresher course for one or two weeks before moving on to these more sports specific skills. Um, you know, how much time we need to spend down here. Technically, when we're younger, we need to spend the majority of our time here. As we, you know, get older and this stuff becomes just more ingrained, um, you know, it's just kind of second nature, we can now spend more time kind of up at the top. Uh, another kind of important point to kind of look at is that, Rich kind of talked on this, was that we tend to monitor or measure, just because we can measure it, we tend to place too much emphasis on it. So right, so kind of think of an iceberg. We you tend to only see the first, you know, the top third or, or you know fourth of an iceberg. What you don't see is everything underneath it. So we tend to emphasize what we can measure, uh, you know, our measurable metrics, so volume, intensity, uh, and then we fail to look at things that we can't measure: uh, central nervous system fatigue, quality of movement. Um, you can't quite read the bottom. The the I I like this example: uh, velocity-based training. Uh, which is, so in the weight room, you would use like a, I'll let you kind of explain it. So you kind of attach this, this little wire to like a barbell and you can see how fast somebody can move it, right? And it's good feedback for the athlete because like, you know, it gives them goals and if they're going faster and faster, it kind of motivates them a lot. Um, and it's this interesting thing of like, right, like we can, instead of just looking at, so the two things you can measure are, you know, your weights and your reps or something along those lines, but you're very hard to measure the speed of movement, but the speed of movement is also incredibly important. Like, you know, if you want to be fast and explosive, you need to be able to move fast and explosive. And you know, when we when we understand that strength is something that on a day has a big day to day variation, um, that hey, how strong you are on one day isn't that's like what you can lift today might not be what you can lift two days from now based on so many different factors. And so maybe going on speed of movement becomes more important because we can. Uh, kind of hone in uh, and, and always be getting the same thing instead of just kind of arbitrarily saying like this weight every time is what you need to do. So anyway, so just this, in, you know, everything that we can measure, I think it's important to understand that what are we missing and what are, and, and making sure that we're not, when we're, we're periodizing and planning our training, only to get wrapped up just in, you know, those things that we kind of see with our eyes. There's a lot of other things that we're kind of missing. I have no idea how long that was. Uh, I'm sorry for rambling on. What questions, concerns, outbursts? Does anyone have? No? I actually have a question. Go. Um, so, yeah, the, the slide with the cannon, you don't have to go back to it, but yeah. um, I was just thinking about that a lot because I always twist when I run, and um, I used to like be really close to a lot of different running families in high school, and some of them had a, like their parents had ran when they were younger and everything, and they always told me like you look great from the waist down, but you like twist. And I was talking to someone once, and they said, oh, that might have to do with like thoracic spine and like flexibility. Do you ever see like that in runners and like how we'll do you go, deal we'll, with that? We will both piggyback yeah. off this yeah, one, Rich. Yeah. I'm gonna let you I mean, go. I've seen it with like so many high school athletes, like their heads are going side to side, and a lot of it's just they don't have enough stability and strength mm -hmm. in like their core because everything kind of works from here, right? So like the stronger you can get this. It just this is like a highway between your upper and lower body, mm -hmm. so just you just get like a general strengthening program like over like six to eight weeks, you see a lot of that stuff uh, subside. So it's this interesting. So this the uh, and this gets really really interesting. So we look at when we look at what's happening at the torso. So a lot of it is is the is is keeping you know whatever happening down here. It's basically the opposite of what's you know so right when this. When this leg goes up, this 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 arm is driving back. So it basically counterbalances what's going on below you, um, and and a little bit of rotation is natural because our, our hips naturally kind of rotate a little bit when we're running. But there's a difference between is there rotation or is there is there uh, not tension? It might be tension. 
So we want to create a little bit of tension as we're as we're rotating rotating or running because that kind of helps kind of slingshot you, if you will, as we're kind of going through. But when there's too much rotation, we lose that tension. And we also just increase, and it, it's usually a sign that we just don't have the pelvic stability. And if our pelvis is more controlled, and if we can control those movements there, this tends to be a lot more um, refined. Um, but there was also, so there was actually research that just came out of Westchester University that looked at 10 meter times with athletes who could use their arms and athletes who couldn't. Uh, and they didn't notice that big of a, a change. And so they're actually thinking that like, oh, your arms actually don't matter as much as you think. And they're mainly just being used to counterbalance whatever's going on down here. The, it was only for 10 meters though, so I'm not like how much we can extrapolate from that. But I think a lot of it, you know, from the, the you know, especially when we look at running, so much of it is about pelvic control. And so if you can't control how your pelvis is moving and keeping it in that stable position, that's why you see like, I mean, a, you know, look at Emma Coburn when she's running. She's got this beautiful posture. Those hips are staying, you know, per, you know and, and you need to see it with a lot of these great runners that they're not having a lot of excessive rotation. And a lot of that's just, that's just wasted movement. So how we kind of control that and like the, you know, in you know, strength training, we kind of look at like anti-rotational exercises that, you know, to train your body how to stay more controlled or I mean, like all the marathon runners I've ever worked with, I mean, if you just get them, if, if you do nothing else but just hip work, you'll see tremendous improvement in everything. Because, like, I mean, your spine sits on top of your hips and everything below mm -hmm. is pretty much connected to your hips. So, like, if you just focus on the hips and, like, all different movements, uh, mm -hmm. like, everything it can offer, then, like, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be good. Thank you. Absolutely. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Guys. Stop that over here. Sure, my uh, camera might have. Oh, did not die. Nice. This is pretty close too.